We're going to finish today our study of the Psalms. How's it been? Have you enjoyed journeying through the Psalms this month as we've been writing and reading and, and thinking on this beautiful section of God's Word? Has it changed or maybe helped your view of God? Has it sharpened or strengthened your worship to God? Has it maybe sparked a sense of creativity in your prayers? Has it heightened your view of the majesty of God and your worship? I love the Psalms. They're beautiful, beautiful songs written by, by man. That's one of the best things about the songs is that it's not God speaking to man. It's man speaking to God and expressing his heart to him. And we're going to end today talking at, looking at Psalm 63. I read about a fascinating man who lives in New York. His name was, I, it's French, I'm not going to say it right, Roger Pesky, I believe is what Google told me how to pronounce it today. So what's fascinating about him is that in 1980, he retired from observing birds and he started observing the ground because he was looking for one thing. He was looking for pocket change. And so from 1980 to the early 2000s, he got $2,000 in pocket change. Since then, it's grown exponentially larger because of phones. And so people are stopped looking at their, at their ground. They're looking at their phones. And so he starts to look for all the coins on the ground. But he said something I thought was really fascinating. as Roger Pesky. He said, in order to do what I do, you have to keep your eyes on where the money is at. I like that. That's what I want to ask you today. Where are your eyes at today? What are you passionate about most? Use that word. He's passionate about that. He's really interested in that. I mean, what is it for you? I mean, it could be sports. It could be hobbies. It could be a certain team, it could be a certain trade, it could be your family, it could be your job. What is it that has your attention? What is it that gets the most of your time, the majority of your focus? Where are your eyes at today? We usually talk about the phrase, when someone's really passionate about something, they come alive when they talk about it. Well, what do you come alive about? Because we see David's passion in, in Psalm 63. What's fascinating, if you're looking at the passage, is that right underneath it, some of these psalms come with a heading, and this heading is Psalm 63, a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. David was only in the wilderness two times. One was when he was fleeing from King Saul. The other is when he was fleeing from his son Absalom. We look down at verse 11. This is the old man, the King David, running from his son. So if you step yourself into that context, David running from his son, who is robbed the throne, the kingdom from him. His family is divided, his nation is in shambles, and David is fleeing for his life with all of that in the backdrop. The fear, the anger, the uncertainty weighing on David's hearts. These are the words he writes in this song. We're reading in Psalm 63, beginning in verse 1. O God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Thus I have seen you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul is satisfied with marrow and fatness and my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in night watches, for you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings, I sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek my life to destroy it, they will go into the depths of the earth. They will be delivered over to the power of the sword. They will be a prey for foxes. But the king will rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him will glory, for the mouths of those who speak lies will be stopped. You know, there's one thing that speaks to us from this psalm. If there's one thing that's, that tends to stand out, it's this. David had an intense passion for his God. An immense passion in worship for his king. I mean, you notice the first verse, right? The first words of that first verse and how it describes him as thirsting for God. His flesh yearning for God. Now get that. You've been there before. Working all day out in the summer heat in Texas, and you're absolutely, completely thirsty. Now get yourself there. Feel it with me. I'm going to make you thirsty for a minute. <laughs> Don't leave. Don't make a mad exodus for the water fountain. Imagine it. Your body starts to quake, and you start to get that sweat. And on your mind, what you think is, is boy, I'd like a glass of water. Your tongue starts to get dry, 
And the only thing you can think of as you start to get exhausted is water. You, you would do anything for water. You think of where you can find it. You think of the quickest way to it. You imagine the taste on your lips and the refreshment it brings to your soul. You are thirsting for something to quench your appetite. David says, I thirst for God. Because he knew when you look at the language of verse 5, I have found something in God I've not found anywhere else. He has a king. He has a sovereign of Israel, a man of great wealth and power. He says, I have found something in God. I've not found, nor will I, anywhere else. My soul is truly satisfied in God. Just as one is satisfied when they drink far more exponentially. Because, in verse 3, the loving kindness, the mercies of God are better than life itself. One writer described David's praise this way. His worship to God described it in terms of his body, all through himself, the wholeness of David's worship to God. How he worshiped him with his lips in verse 3, my lips will praise you. With his tongue in verse 4, so I will bless you. With his hands in verse 4, I will lift my hands in your name. With his mouth in verse 5, my mouth offers praises. With his memory in verse 6, when I remember you on my bed. And even with his intellect, as he, as he meditates or thinks upon God in the night watches, but again, you, you just listen to the descriptive terms. Verse 4, I lift my hands to your name. And verse 5, it's not just that he sings praises, but he sings these praises with joyful lips. And in verse 7, it's not just that he sings to the Lord. He's not just singing a hymn, but he's singing with joy. Let me ask you a question this morning. When you read psalms like this, and this is not unique, you find many psalms of David and psalms of some that we don't have their author and it's a lot like this, worship that is described as exuberant, full of praise and passion. Let me ask you a question this morning. Does this seem strange to you? Does this picture of this kind of worship seem foreign to you, different from your own? Does it seem like David's overindulgence, if you will, of the outpouring of praise, does it seem like a bit much compared to maybe yourself? You know, oftentimes when we talk about passion in worship or the energy in worship or the emotions in worship, we make the point, and here's the point, we say if someone has emotions in worship, if there's an expression of praise, it comes out of a response to the truth. The, the more greatly you see God for who he is revealed in his word, it produces out of us this, this real, true, genuine passion. It's not about the place. It's not about the lights. It's not about the speaker. It's not about any of the aesthetics. It's a response to the truth. We've mentioned this in our first hour from Psalm 95. Oh, come, let us, look, look at these words again. Look at the words. Sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. Why? For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. The shouting joyfully, the outpouring of praise is a response to the truth. Well, here's a question for you. What happens when someone has the truth, but they don't have passion? We say passion ought to come out of response to the truth. Well, what happens when someone has truth but no passion, but no zeal? But that worship is lifeless and dead and cold. Or maybe, to, to paint the analogy, you ever pay attention to this in your car? You know you have a dashboard. They're getting a lot more fancy these days. But the old typical dashboards show you a few things. They show you how fast you're going, if you ever see that. They show you your in tank. <laughs> Right, what you're putting in, how much fuel you have, and then it shows you your temperature gauge, and you really don't pay too much attention until it's 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 too far, it's too hot, and your car starts beeping at you. Right? But it indicates the temperature of the car. Do you realize that Jesus talked about our devotion to Him, our devotion to God in terms of temperature, because He wrote to the church in Laodicea, and He says, you know, you're, you're not hot, you're not cold, you're lukewarm. No one wants a lukewarm drink. I'm going to spit you out. You're lacking what it is I'm looking for, that spiritual fervor. I want you to think about this. What would this, the temperature gauge of your heart read today in terms of your devotion to God? Where is that? You're looking at the temperature gauge. Are you on fire for God, full of zeal, full of passion? 
But like David, God is your unceasing desire. You want him more than anything else. And when you praise him and you worship him, oh, it's all from the heart. And it's sincere. Shouting it forth, that's just like you. Or maybe are you on the other spectrum? You kind of care less. I'm here because I don't want to get in trouble. Or maybe I'm in the middle. You know, I'm here. But let's just not go all out, okay? Let's not go crazy. I mean, God is good. And it's all good. But let's, let's calm down a little bit. There's a lot of things that are important in life. I'm apathetic. I'm indifferent. I'm just asking today, has, has your worship grown cold? Has your passion for the Lord weaned? I don't know. I can't see your gauge, but I'm asking you today to gauge yourself. Sometimes worship grows cold when this is nothing more than a stop in our week. The routine of, which, of, of life, much like work, it's like sports and schools and schedules. This is just something we have to do. For some, it grows cold because to us, we're rehearsing things that we all know to each other. We know God is good. We're reading the same book. We kind of take God out of the picture, and we forget that he's here, ever present where we are. And I think for many of us, we've talked about this a lot, is that the reason worship grows cold is that we're just distracted. I mean, I want to pay attention, and I want to focus but boy, we're, we're, we're talking about Jesus and we're singing about Jesus, but I know I've got something to do today or this is what's happening in my life. Or if you're with me now, kids, little kids, you don't know what happened when you're here at worship. There was something that was sung and someone preached. That's <laughs> Holly's favorite quote. I asked her how the sermon went. She goes, did you preach today? I said, yes. <laughs> there will be a time. It's hard when you're distracted, isn't it? But here's the thing. Cold, lifeless worship. I'm not, I am not at all indicating anything here when I say the statement, so please don't think I'm, I'm reflecting on us as a church family. I just want you to think this through with me. Funeral songs, empty prayers, empty, meaningless prayers, traditional prayers, distracted partaking of the Lord's Supper, lifeless sermons, all offer to and from cadavers in the pew, do we expect when we leave from such a service to stir up one another to love and to good works? I mean, do we expect to leave from such an assembly thinking there's going to be a difference in my life now? I'm going to walk closer to Jesus. I am ready and well equipped to make it with God this week after leaving such a, of a kind of assembly. No. Oh. And I believe for so many of us the problem is that we put the straight jacket of 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 40 on and we say, well, hang on. You can't be passionate. You can't be zealous. No shouting in here. No raising your hands because everything must be done decently and in order. And so we build this extreme that either your worship can be reverent or it can be passionate. Either it can be respectful of God or it can be full of exuberance and zeal. Well, brethren, why does it have to be either or? Can we not be respectful of God and full of zeal, full of the Spirit? Can it not be Spirit and in truth? Can we not mean everything that we say and it's full of sincerity and we're doing so in a way by the book to please God and yet it's pouring forth because we want it and we mean it. You know what the reality is? We talk about comfort sometimes. What's comfortable to me? What's comfortable to you? I'm, I'm not comfortable with that and then our our traditions with worship is simply that we are the product of our traditions of how we've been raised and many of you like me were raised in a very somber and respectful setting in terms of worship but if you ever step outside of that tradition boy it's scary to do so but you go somewhere you're not familiar with maybe in a different place you're not familiar with Maybe in a different country like we saw this morning and you're not familiar with. You know what you'll see? Things you're not comfortable with because it's not a part of your tradition. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It means it's something I'm unfamiliar with. One of my best friends, he's here with us last year, Timothy Ruffin, who did our blast weekend. He and I were preaching together in Chattanooga, Tennessee. If you don't know Tim, he's a young black preacher, 29 years old. There was a gospel meeting in town at a church I had not even heard of. He says, I want you to go with me. And so we went, and he stopped me at the door, and he said, I want you to know something. I said, what's that? He goes, you are now going to see what I feel every Sunday. 
And so I walked in and was the only white man in that congregation. And it was different than anything I'd ever seen. The response of, of, of songs, the response of preaching, the way that they sang the song was different than how I had learned them. Wrong? No. Different? Yes. And you know what I learned? Perspective. Perspective. I am not, please do not get me wrong, I am not saying I want you to start raising hands this morning. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying I want you to start raising your hands or closing your eyes or singing louder than you sung before or kneeling when you pray, although no, none of those things would be wrong if genuine. None of those would be in error with the scripture if that was all genuine. The reality is passion in worship has very little to do with the position of your body. You see, Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 6 that you could put on a face of sincere worship. He's talking here about fasting. He says, whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance in order to be fasting by men. But I say to you, they have the reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you may not be seen may not be seen fasting by men, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will repay you. That's the idea. It's not about the fasting of the flesh. It's the fasting of the heart. Or even we say about singing, singing loud. It's not about the volume of our singing, the volume of, of how we sing. Isaiah 29 reminds us, the Lord says, because of this, the people draw near with their words and honor me with their lips, or their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me. What he's saying is, Singing loud enough to, to burst the rafters means nothing if that's not coming from the heart. So let me rephrase this. Passion and worship is not about the position of the body. It's about the disposition of the heart. But I would say this. I'm not, I'm not targeting anyone. I'm just asking you to think this morning. There are times in our life when that passion seems to radiate. You can't control it because of how we feel. The thanks, the joy, the overall excitement from what it is that we are seeing and witnessing. And yet sometimes we can become so, so stale and solemn here. When in the presence of the King of Kings... Could it be that my solemnness is not merely out of tradition? Could it be that my temperature has waned, that that fire has gone out, and I'm simply walking through tradition, I'm going through the routine, and I'm not here to worship the king? So let's end with this. Maybe that's me. Maybe I'm here, and my passion for God has grown cold. I, my zeal, my desire for his presence for bending in prayer, for opening his word. It's, it's not what it should be, not what it used to be. Well, how do you spark that back up? How do you light the fire? How do I have what David had in Psalm 63 of that genuine passion for the Lord? Well, I think if we could see what David saw, if we could keep it fresh in our minds, we would never struggle with this. He saw three things that if we would keep them in our gaze, we'll have that passion every time. And here's what it is. Number one, he saw what has been. He saw what has been in verse 6. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate you on the night watches, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. David was able to walk through memory lane. He says, God, I remember you have been with me. The lion and the bear in the wilderness, you were with me. Facing that giant all alone in that valley, you were with me. When I became king, you made me king. The family that I have, the friends, my support system, they all came from you. And even when he failed, even when he sinned, the grace he received, God was with him. And even here, abandoned by his country, forsaken by his family, he is not alone. He was able to remember what has been. If you want to reignite the passion in your heart for God, do a little inventory. Walk back through memory lane. What has the Lord done for you? No, not for us as a church family. What has the Lord done for you? You know, I think a good, a good place to begin, maybe a working point, if this is something you want to spend a little more time with this week, is Psalm 103. Again, David's words. But if you look at Psalm 103 and David speaking about what the Lord has done in his life, will you just, will you let his words 
drive the inventory of your life? Help you in your memories past? Because here's a question for you. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Let me ask you, like David, has he ever healed any sickness in your life? Sickness that you have had? Sickness that a loved one has had and you prayed and you were on your knees and he took that sickness away. Praise the Lord. Has he done that for you? Or how about this? Who crowns your life with loving kindness and compassion. Ever wondered why things are so good when we far from deserve it? Why would God love us after what we've done to him? Why on earth would he give us what we have? Not just heaven, not just Jesus. Even the little things, as maybe we'll put up right here right now. The good things, families, money and wealth to where we will not even doubt the dollars in our banks. We will never, never go looking for food. So completely and totally satisfied with what we have here on earth. God gave you that. And God who gave us the strength in our bodies and the talents of our flesh and the strength and the wisdom of our minds and God who gave us opportunities for all the things that we've been able to do and to see and experience. God who has seen us through incredibly hard times. Praise the Lord. Has he satisfied your life up to this point with good years and with good things? But even if if we just stopped at that first phrase... I can't answer this one for you. I can't. But you can. Every sin, every word, every word I spoke, every curse I uttered, everything I clicked and saw and repeated and saw again, everything that never exited here, but boy, it was here, the hate and the lust and the evil, And the times I knew it was wrong, and I did it anyway. To have it all gone. Every sin, every stain. The debt and its whole repaid. And that pit I dug. That pit of addiction. That pit of despair. That pit of pitifulness, hopelessness. You know how easy it would have been God to say, you dug yourself in there, get yourself out. You did this, you wanted to have life on your own, you didn't want me, good luck. And now God can take someone like me and like you and not just pull us out of that pit, but to allow the end of our years to be full of redemption. That is, you're not done yet. Sinners can become saints in my kingdom. Saul's can become Paul's in my kingdom. I can redeem your years. I can dig you out of that pit. I can bring great life for once you sow death. What has the Lord done for you, brethren? Don't we sing that? Didn't we just sing that but a moment ago? And when I think that God, his son, not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take that in. I would not give you my son. I would not give you a child of mine for everything the world could offer, but he gave you his son. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. You want to talk about passion for God? When Peter talked about those incredible attributes of adding to your faith in 2 Peter 1, he says, he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even the blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from old sins. He forgot. He forgot about Calvary. He forgot about the blood. He forgot about the gift of God. You want to have a genuine passion for God? You never get your eyes off of Calvary, good brethren. You bend your knees at the cross every morning. You see what it is. David came into the sanctuary of God and he saw two incredible things. Verse 2, he stepped into the sanctuary of God to see the power and the glory of the Almighty. I want you to, to carry this thought with you for a minute. 
it's amazing for David, a man full of fear and angst and anger and hurt, to be able to step into the sanctuary of God, stepping out of the world into the presence of God and to see things the way they really are. And that's our challenge. Because in the world, it seems like evil is prevalent and sin is everywhere. It seems like Satan is winning, that the fight is futile. In fact, it's over. It seems that, that temptation is inevitable and the giving in to that temptation is going to happen. But when we step out of the world into the presence of God, we see something different. It's different for us. You know what it's like? Stepping from the world, maybe it's relationships that are broken or a marriage that's not working or maybe it's trying to raise teenagers. Any of you here raising teenagers, trying to help them live godly lives in a world like today? Or maybe it's trying to overcome temptations and the surroundings in a work environment that just is not conducive for a holy lifestyle. Or maybe, as we've been talking about this month, it's living having bound when it seems like every step I take, the world is pulling me back. But for that moment, to step out of the world into the presence of God. No, God is not tied to this place. I'm not talking about Sunday mornings. And it's not that God is not in the world everywhere we are. It's that in this moment, in this concentrated moment, my eyes are purely on the king. No distractions from the world. No voice from Satan himself. When I step into the presence of God, my perspective changes. Instead of how strong Satan is, look at verse 2. I saw the power of God. Instead of how impressive the world is, how alluring the world is, I saw the glory of the king. You see? Stepping out of the world and into the presence of God will change you completely. He saw the power of God. Which means God was not just doing things, brethren. God is doing things today. God is at work today. It's not that God could do things before and that God was with his people, God is and will today. And not just that God gives the victory, the victory over Satan, the victory over sin, he gives the victory over the grave. As Paul would say, when you pray in Ephesians 3, you pray that God can do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all that you ask. You see the power of God when I step away from the world. But here's the other one. I love that Ricky pointed to this last week. I know it was last week. We've slept since then. But last week in Romans, or Psalm 8, he showed us about the majesty of God and how he sees you and he sees me. I know you've seen things like these before. This is all on Google. But we see, we, so often we see ourselves as so big, so strong, USA all the way, nothing we can't do. And we see ourselves as so powerful and so mighty. We're so innovative, we're so creative. So wise and we're so wealthy. And we are. We are compared to some. But when you just kind of step back a little bit, you step back. And boy, our planet really doesn't look very big compared to other planets. In fact, compared to the sun, it was estimated that one million of our planets could fit inside the sun. One million. You can't see Texas on that picture. Did you know over 100 billion stars are in our Milky Way? And God knows them all by name. And that there's about 2 trillion observable galaxies today, which contain somewhere between 10 million to 2 trillion stars. And God knows them all by name. The heavens declare the glory of God. But what is man? Jesus knows me. This I love. That he knows you. Not just your name. Not the peripheral things you can find on the internet. He knows your walk. He knows your heart. 
He knows your life. He knows you. Do you realize what that means? When I stepped into the sanctuary, I observed the power and the glory of God. When I, and not just Sundays, when I, and not just Wednesday nights, when I in my daily walk take the time to separate myself and my mind from the world and to step into the presence of God, I see his power. I leave realizing that I am capable of doing all things in Jesus Christ, that the battle is not over and that he will allow me and give me the strength to handle every temptation I face this day. And when I step into the presence of God from the world, I'm able to see that there is nothing this world could possibly owe me or could possibly offer to me that would ever compare to what it is I have in Jesus Christ. Do you realize that? The offering of the world compared to the offering of God is but a Dixie cup of water compared to the oceans in his hand. It's like someone lost in the dark and the world is offering a flashlight when God says, I am the sun. Verse five, look at it again. Where have I found this satisfaction? Where have I found this completion? That is why David could say, you, you are better than life itself. Your love, your mercies are better than life. Do you think maybe that's why Jesus would say that he who seeks to save his life must what? Let's lose it. Because if you're willing to give it all up for Jesus, brethren, you'll find real life. You want to have passion for God? See it. Take some time this week. Will you do it with me? Step out of the world and step into the presence of God. Undistracted. No phones, no TVs, no deadlines. Quiet. Quiet your mind. Step into his word. And you will see something you've, you've desperately needed to see. And David saw what is to come. It's interesting in the end, verse 9 through 11, David seems confident of the future. Confident that God is going to grant him a victory through his enemies, which included his son. But that's the amazing thing, is it not? David was able to see, because of God, what life looks like tomorrow. God has been with me before. God has given me victories before. And I am confident God will give me the victory through this. I read a a, a quote this past week from C.S. Lewis who said, These poets knew far less reason than we for loving God. They did not know that he offered them eternal joy, still less that he would die to win it for them. Yet they expressed a longing for him, for his mere presence. They longed to live all their days in the temple so that they may constantly see the fair beauty of the Lord. Their longing to go up to Jerusalem and appear before the presence of God is like a physical thirst. From Jerusalem, his presence flashes out in perfect beauty. Lacking that encounter with them, their souls are like a parched, are parched like a waterless countryside. Is that it? All that we see and all that we know this side of the cross. And if David was able to be so passionate with what he knew, good brethren, the point he's making is how far much more we David was able to see what life would look like tomorrow. Let me ask you, do you see what life is going to look like tomorrow in Jesus? What's tomorrow like because of Jesus? Well, I don't know. What's going to happen to the stock markets? What's going to happen to the economy? What's going to happen to the next election? Jesus is on the throne. And his love... And his grace and his mercy are abundant, are never ending. And that tomorrow Jesus will win the hearts of men and save souls by his blood redeemed through Calvary. And that tomorrow Jesus is going to come and he is going to end all evil and all wickedness. And he will bring his redeemed, his ransomed souls, and he will conquer death and victory. And we will go to heaven with God's people. And we there before the throne of God will sing and shout the victory. That's what's happening tomorrow. You see? You want a reason to sing for joy? 
I know what's coming tomorrow. There is no fear about tomorrow. Is that not what we sing? Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth living because he lives. There's this famous agnostic in the 18th century named Robert Ingersoll. Hated God. Did not at all believe in life after death. Well, when he died, I read this this morning. When he died, there's a statement given about his funeral. He died unexpectedly. And it was said that all those who mourned his death were found hopeless because of his belief or disbelief in God. But there's this phrase said about him. It says, at his memorial, there will be no singing there. Brethren, what's Revelation 5 and verse 9 say? And they sang a new song. Worthy is the Lamb able to open the seals of the scroll. There will be singing there. There will be singing. In fact, have you thought of that? Have you thought of what worship would look like in heaven? Have you thought about from the perspective of this morning at 9 o'clock, saints gathered from all across the globe of all nations and tongues and tribes, men and women from every generation, from as early as Adam to now in 2020, gathered before the throne of God and every voice unified, all eyes fixed and focused, all hearts as one as we sing the praises of the Lamb on the throne. Have you thought about what it would be like to worship God in heaven? How will you worship him? What will pull forth from your heart in the presence of the Lord Almighty? Because brethren, the glory of heaven ought to be seen in a foretaste of what we've done here today. Light the fire. Renew the zeal. Spark that fierce love and desire for your king. Don't settle for less. Don't let your zeal for God grow cold. Don't let your worship become meaningless and lifeless. Renew it. Invigorate it. Step out of the world into the presence of God with an open book and let the presence of God and the truth of his word reignite that love and that passion for him again. Thank you for, for listening so well today. If you've come our way this morning and you're in need of some help, you've come to a good place. Maybe you're in need of starting your relationship with God and your journey with him, and we're glad you're here. If we can help answer some questions or help point you in the right direction, we'd love to do so. If maybe you're here and you're carrying some burdens of some things, some decisions in your life, and you'd like some prayers or some help to get back on that right track, again, we'd like to help you this morning. If we can help you or pray for you, if we can help point you in that right direction, you need to be right here this morning. If we can help you in any way, let's do it right now as we stand and as we sing.